Richard Nixon saw the world with a chip on his shoulder. In some of his biographies and speeches, he talked about representing the forgotten person, the great silent majority, he called them. And he sourced this to a slight in his boyhood. He had attended a pretty elite all-male boarding school in California, but the school was really divided, at least according to his recounting, between those who came from extremely wealthy families, which Nixon did not, and those who did not, from the quote-unquote other side of the tracks, as much as that could really apply at an all-male elite boarding school um, earlier in this, this past century. In any case, Nixon tries to join the elite cool kids fraternity and is kicked out and mocked that he even applies, and then says that he carries this chip on his shoulder about this snub, about this slight, for the rest of his life. And so he wants to win, and he wants to win at all costs in any endeavor. And that, of course, applies to presidential politics. But his early experiences in presidential politics reinforce this chip. Um, he is, in 1960, he loses a close contest to John F. Kennedy. One of the reasons, of course, he says and many people think that he lost is because of his appearance, some sort of superficial appearance judgment in the 1960 presidential debate. But there's also a forgotten episode, which is when Nixon had been Eisenhower's VP for eight years. And the news media and the Republican Party go to get Eisenhower's endorsement of Nixon for the 1960 presidential election to curry some favor with voters. And standing outside of his ranch in Pennsylvania, Dwight Eisenhower is asked on camera, what are some of Richard Nixon's greatest accomplishments and contribution to the Eisenhower administration in the 1950s? And the old general, looking pensively off in the distance, pauses and says, if you give me a week, I might think of one which is not exactly the greatest endorsement a president has given a potentially future president. So that reinforces Nixon's chip on his shoulder. He loses a close contest in 60. Then he, to rehabilitate his image, he thinks he's going to become governor of California. So he runs for the 1962 gubernatorial contest in California, his home state, loses that and loses it by a larger margin than he lost to Kennedy. He's feeling apoplectic. He thinks and flirts with a 1964 run, but decides that the optics aren't quite right, and he's likely to lose to Lyndon Johnson, and he can't handle another loss. He rebounds like a phoenix in 1968, loses, wins again, but a very, very tight contest against Hubert Humphrey. And so what Nixon really wants in 72 is to win, and he wants to win big. Biographers have said over and over again that he wanted an overwhelming kind of a victory. And so to understand the tactics that he was willing to employ in the 72 election, what's important is to focus on McGovern, who he eventually beat, but also to focus on others um, whose careers he destroyed along the way. And really the telltale figure here, the illustrative figure here, is the early front runner for the Democratic national nomination in 1972, a guy whose name was Ed Muskie. Ed Muskie at the time was sort of the vaguely Obama-ish figure, um, for, as Obama was in 2008. Ed Muskie was new blood. Ed Muskie had visionary ideas. Ed Muskie was a really great speaker on the stump. Um, Ed Muskie was not an also-ran politician in that sense. And so one of the things that Nixon's folks, especially Creep, the, the committee to reelect the president, identified early in the Democratic primary contest is that to win in 72, they needed to destroy Ed Muskie. So before Muskie even gets the nomination, peculiar things are happening to Muskie's campaign. There are stink bombs, for instance, that keep showing up and exploding in every one of his offices in every primary state in South Carolina, in New Hampshire, especially in Iowa. One of the other things that's happening, number two, but one other dirty trick that Nixon's team is pulling, is that well, seemingly well-meaning, very nice, very competent and capable volunteers who claim to be just wild about Ed Muskie, right? Die-hard liberals who are wild about Ed Muskie keep showing up at Muskie headquarters in Nashua, New Hampshire, in Ames, Iowa, you get the idea, and wanting to volunteer. Then they ingratiate themselves with the powers that be in a local campaign office, and then they begin subverting the campaign from the inside out. In Iowa, for instance, one of the so-called volunteers, these double agents, were taking pictures of typewriters that the campaign team was using to send out mailers and request money and schedule meetings and type speeches, and took pictures of those and then said that they had been stolen from local printing offices as well as Iowa State, uh, the Iowa State government, and then sends those to conservative newspapers who are running uh, running stories saying that the Muskie team's entire communication operation is being financed on and written on stolen typewriters. These kinds of sabotaging events. There was also outright fraud and forgery. So a third example is an identity issue. 
So Ed Muskie's campaigning in Florida, but the most immediate contest that he's really campaigning for is the New Hampshire primary in 1972. And he's one of the front runners. And peculiar ads keep showing up and peculiar stories keep showing up in Florida newspapers uh, ahead of the New Hampshire contest. One of which questions whether or not Ed Muskie is a secret anti-Semite and keeps alleging that he will not consider a Jewish person to be vice president because of his anti-Semitism. There's also similar articles being planted that he is a misogynist, uh, that he is a racist, and he won't consider members of his cabinet who are black, who are women, because he harbors all these secret, virulent, misogynistic, racist, anti-Semitic views. And so one person writes to the Manchester Union leader, this guy Paul Morrison, writes a letter saying that he has a letter from Ed Muskie in which he wrote, how can you understand the problems of a state of a big diverse state like Florida, since you're just from Maine, which is a relatively homogenous state. You can't understand a big diverse state if you're from a relatively homogenous state. And this guy Paul Morrison claims that Ed Muskie wrote him back and said, I understand these problems because in Maine, as in much of New England, we have lots of Canucks, right? The phrase Canuck is an incredibly derogatory term, or was then, for French Canadian citizens of the United States, of whom there are many in Maine who would take, that, take real offense to that term, as well as 30% of the voting public in a place like New Hampshire would take offense to that. The Manchester Union leader ends up running this letter that Paul Morrison claims to have been handwritten by Ed Muskie. It turns out it's a complete forgery. A Nixon staffer, a Crete member, later admitted under oath in 1973 that they just made the entire thing up to create splits within the Democratic coalition, to create group infighting amongst identity groups, right? Amongst African Americans, amongst women, amongst Jews, and so forth. The fourth example is the Jane letter. Muskie's wife's name at the time was Jane. There's a Manchester Union leader uh, article that runs saying that Jane is an alcoholic, that Jane likes to drink several martinis before dinner, and anything more than one martini is by definition, a lot of martinis, maybe too many martinis, also claims a secret source from inside the campaign, later, of course, made up entirely by Creep, a person who was just posing as a member of the Muskie staff who was lying to the Manchester Union leader in order to plant a negative story, but says that Jane is not exactly first lady material because she likes to tell off-color jokes and get drunk before dinner, right? So she's sabotaging his name as well as Jane Muskie's name, and it all leads to Muskie having an ultimate breakdown. He decides he's going to clear his name. He's going to confront Nixon from everything about the stink bombs to the forgeries to the planted stories about his wife. And so he gets a staff member to drive a flatbed truck up to the newspaper in question, the Manchester Union leader. And he gets on the flatbed truck and he's going to give a big dramatic speech to clear his name ahead of the New Hampshire primary. And his campaign never recovers from it.